Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, first of all, to uh, the College and the Skeptics Society for having me here this evening. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to see so many people as well. It's fantastic. Um, so as Ian said, this evening I'm going to speak about uh, the so-called French disease or the French pox uh, in early modern Europe and look at how early modern Europeans uh, understood and responded to this disease. I'll be talking quite broadly uh, for the time period 1495 to 1700, uh, and you'll notice quite a lot of the evidence that I'm going to talk about uh, will be based on the city of Nuremberg, because this is one of the cities that I've been researching for the last three years for my now almost complete doctoral thesis. So uh, I'm quite sure most of you, or all of you, I would hope, are familiar with our modern concept of syphilis, uh, principally sexually transmitted disease caused by the bacterium Treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum. However, many historians, including, as you can see, Claudia Stein, have argued that diseases are sociocultural constructs that are specific to a particular scientific and sociocultural setting at a given time. And I hope uh, in the course of the next 30 minutes or so, I will be able to give you some insight into the early modern concepts of the French pox and to show how it's really founded in a system of belief, in systems of knowledge that are utterly and completely different in so many ways to our own. Um, and to reflect this conceptual difference uh, throughout the talk, I will be using the term French pox or just sometimes pox um, rather than talking about syphilis specifically. So, uh, in the winter of 1494 to 1495, Charles VIII of France laid siege, laid siege to the city of Naples. However, as his army and all of those who had fought at the siege later began to withdraw from the city and pull back uh, up through the Italian peninsula, heading back to Spain, Scotland, uh, France, of course, and the Germanic lands, Europeans began to comment on the appearance of a strange and apparently new uh, horrifying illness. Victims suffered with various symptoms, including, as you can see from the illustration attributed to Durer, uh, outbreaks of ulcerations and pustules on their body. They were racked with horrific pains, particularly intensely at night. Um, and one contemporary witness, and indeed victim of the disease, Josef Grunpeck, wrote in 1503 that the suffering caused by the disease was so horrific that victims prayed for death to come as soon as possible. Indeed, in its most horrific form, they believed it started to rot away the bones of the living victims. So as I said, the disease spreads incredibly rapidly. It's here in Scotland by 1497, and it's in Russia no later than 1500. So how then did Europeans understand this new disease, um, or this apparently new disease? How did they talk about it and interpret it? Well, of course, central to the early modern lens on the world is religion. Uh, and of course, it played, this plays a major role in how they understood the French disease as well. Um, and it was key, of course, not only to interpreting this disease, but religion is commonly invoked to understand all kinds of pandemic and epidemic outbreaks at this time. And we see this on the 7th of August, 1495, when Maximilian I, the Holy Roman Emperor, issued uh, the Mandate gegen Gotteslästerung, or the Edict Against Blasphemy, at the Imperial Diet in Worms. And in the, in the edict, uh, Maximilian claimed that the disease was, had in, entered into the Germanic lands as a consequence of the proliferation of sin there, uh, and specifically, indeed, the sin of blasphemy. Um, however, I think we need to tread something of a middle line when we think about um, how powerful religion is in interpreting this disease. Certainly, we cannot deny that it is one of the key ways that early moderns interpret the world, but there has been something of a tendency, I would argue, for us to overstate the impact of the disease sin paradigm when talking about the French pox. And I think this really comes from much later interpretations of the disease and the failure to interpret how, or the failure to separate how the disease 
disease was interpreted in the 18th century onwards from the early modern interpretations. Uh, so as Anne-Marie Kinzelbach says, it is no more influential in the case of the French pox than it is with any other um, pandemic outbreak in this period. So early moderns um, had many, many ways to explain how God had caused the disease to first arise on Earth. Um, lots of technical and very brilliant ideas, but I don't have time to speak about them right now. So if you'd like to know more, please do ask me a question. Much more central to what I'd like to speak about this evening uh, is contagion and early modern ideas of how the disease was spread. Certainly from the outset, there was no doubt that this was a sexually transmitted disease, but it wasn't seen as exclusively sexually transmitted. Uh, there was immense fear that the disease was spreading through various non, what we can call non-venereal forms of contagion, so through the clothing, drinking vessels, foods, and air. And we see this in how municipal authorities respond to the disease. So in 1496, the city council of Frankfurt am Main received a note from the, from the city's official doctors who said because the disease was now clearly visible in the city, a list of all of the infected should be made up so that they could be separated away from the healthy population. Here in Edinburgh in 1497, James IV issued his Grand Gore Act, which stated that all of those infected with the disease were to proceed to the island of Inchkeith in the Firth of Forth for quarantine, and those who failed to do so would be branded and banished from the city. In Aberdeen, we see something of a slightly different approach, at least initially in 1497, uh, because the only order in Aberdeen in 1497 states simply that all prostitutes are to cease practicing their trade, um, for, uh, again, under pain of punishment, um, to stop the spread of the disease. However, it seems that the council wasn't really ultimately convinced that this was enough to halt the spread of the disease, because in later orders, such as those in 1507 and 1530, as well as reiterating the ban on prostitution, they also warned that anyone infected with the disease was to stay well away from their neighbours, and particularly they were to stay away from anywhere that food was being prepared. In 1515, in Rome, Pope Leo X issues the bull Salvatoris Nostri Domini Jesu Christi, in which he states that the city is um, infested with the sick poor. It's not really very popely language. Um, it's infested with sick, incurable poor, including those infected with what he calls uh, Morbus Gallicus, or the French disease. And these people are to be moved uh, into the city's hospitals by force, if necessary, um, so that the healthy population can be protected and kept safe from any threat of infection that they might pick up simply by having close physical proximity with these people. Uh, and then in 1504, again, we have some rather fearful, uh, some fearful clergy uh, who were quite worried about the fact that um, while they were giving out communion, they were worried that somehow they would pick up the disease on the robes and the religious paraphernalia that they were using, and they asked for a separate cupboard so that they could so store this away separate uh, to everything else in the cathedral and avoid catching the disease. And uh, the disease, which is of course known uh, as die Franzosen in Nuremberg, or the French, again, the French disease, um, again, we see significant anxiety about how it's spreading. Um, a report from the city doctors in 1496 stated that they were worried that it might be being spread by tainted or sulfuric wine through the clothes of infected persons, and simply they said they believed that you could catch the disease with cl from close physical proximity from someone who had the French pox. The city council were also quite concerned that the disease was coming from infected pig meat too. So Nuremberg at this time, I should say, is a free imperial city governed by a city council, which, uh, and the only person that the council has to respond uh, to is the, is the emperor. So the, the entire day-to-day -day running of the city is completely in the hands of the Rat or the city council. And in 1496, with the appearance of the disease, they immediately began to take measures um, to try and curtail its spread and to protect their healthy population. So among the first things that they did uh, was an, they ordered an inspection of all of those who cared for the city's pigs. They ordered that all sick persons were to proceed to the Heilig Kreutz Hospital, which you can see in the picture on the slide. Uh, and this, uh, importantly, this hospital is located outside of the city walls. So this is very reminiscent of what happens in many European cities in times of plague. You get those who are infected as far away from your healthy population as you possibly can. 
Um, they also issued several, several orders during the late 15th and early 16th centuries, stating that any uh, persons infected with the French pox needed to be removed out of public spaces, particularly the bridges and the streets. Um, and they were also banned from entering into the public baths, and there was penalties on the bathmasters if they let anybody with the French pox in. And there was also warnings to surgeons about not switching um, surgical instruments, not using surgical instruments uh, on, on pox people and then using them on people who weren't infected with this disease. So clearly the pox presented a significant public health challenge at the time. Uh, it wasn't something they'd dealt with before, and the council, um, the council had to bring in numerous measures, and um, as you'll see, they also have to bring in quite a lot of expenditure to deal with the disease as well. But it wasn't totally an event without opportunity either. During the late 15th century, the concepts of the deserving and the undeserving poor had become deeply entrenched in Western European society. So the deserving poor are persons like um, artisans, craftspersons, laborers who had fallen on hard times through no fault of their own, uh, versus the undeserving poor, who were usually, usually categorized as non-native itinerant beggars who moved from place to place, persons who were believed to be very immoral or portrayed as being very immoral, um, and who were seen or categorized as kind of preying on the charity of good and godly citizens. Um, and during the 15th century, the city council of Nuremberg is doing everything it can to try to, um, to try to minimize the amount of charity and the amount of expenditure that is being given to the undeserving poor. And the pox presented quite an opportunity for, uh, for the council and a justification uh, to allow them to uh, order the expulsion of any non-native beggars infected with the disease. As long as they could walk, they were to be thrown out of the city. And they also tightened their regulations against admitting such people into the city as well, regardless of whether they were infected or not. Well, this was the ideal anyway. These were the kind of orders that they set out. However, my research into individual cases um, of people who presented with the disease has shown that actually in the majority of cases where the council had to consider a poor person who was so poor that they couldn't afford aid, but also weren't really entitled to aid under the city's rules, in the majority of, the, of these instances, the council actually decided to give aid. There's very few instances where the council takes any kind of punitive action. Um, so why did they do this? Well, very often the council will say, Ausbaumherzigkeit, out of compassion, we will give this person uh, a certain amount of aid or we will fund their treatment uh, to help them return to health. And we certainly can't doubt the sincerity uh, that comes behind this idea of compassion and the kind of religious motivation that they would have felt for it at the time. However, Baumherzigkeit and compassion also provided a nice way for the council, while appearing very godly and good in its, uh, in its government, it provided them with an excellent way to kind of implement something more practical. Because if you have a person who is really quite sick with this disease, um, the chances are even if you remove them outside of the city walls, they may not be able to get very far away from the city itself, so they're still going to be within the territories of Nuremberg. And that's still an issue for the, that's still an issue for the government. Um, and they're still, so they're going to be posing a public health threat to the persons that the city is responsible for, if not people within the city. So it's much easier for the city to, to offer them some treatment, to try and get them back to at least enough health that they can certainly leave the city's environs. But what kind of help really was, um, was the city council offering? What kind of charity was available? Well, for anyone who lived in the city for half a year or more, like I said, uh, there was that option of going to the Heilig Kreuz Hospital. Initially, they wanted everyone to go to this hospital when the disease broke out. But by the end of the 15th century, they start to kind of regulate this and they say, well, only the poor people will come here. It was kind of assumed that anyone wealthy enough would take their treatment uh, at home or elsewhere. Um, and then by the mid 16th century, the council decides to fund and construct um, a specific hospital 
to, uh, to treat the pox. This is the Franzosen House. And the expenditure on this hospital becomes absolutely huge. It reaches 2,000 golden plus at the end of the 16th century, uh, which is maybe not a lot if you don't know about golden, but it's, it's a huge amount of the city's expenditure, and it's a huge financial pressure for them at times as well. In addition to funding the day-to-day -day running of the Franzosen House, they... Um, the city also paid the individual medical fees uh, for patients who had their treatment there or sometimes had their treatment elsewhere as well. And these treatments could last anywhere between uh, four weeks to eight weeks. They were kind of the typical time periods, but I've also found cases that they funded uh, for over a year as well. So thus far, I've been kind of... Um, speaking very heavily on um, the 15th and the 16th, um, the 15th and the 16th centuries, um, as you'll have, uh, well, as, as, as you'll have clearly gathered. Um, but kind of coming back to, back to the title of my talk and uh, into the 17th century, at the start of the 17th century, a Strasbourg uh, surgeon wrote in his book that syphilis was like an angry dog which enters a community and which must be controlled to protect the healthy population. Now, historians have really uh, very heavily underplayed, um, I argue, uh, they've deeply underplayed the influence of non-venereal theories of contagion. Um, most historians argue that after 1520, they're not really important, that everybody, they argue that everybody is focusing on uh, the French pox as a sexually transmitted disease. Um, and certainly we can't deny that there is a very heavy um, interest in the sexual forms of contagion in terms of medical theorizing um, and increasingly perhaps as well in terms of the moral environment. But I argue that non-venereal theories of contagion not only persist, but they remain very, very important for medical and lay thinking. And we see this reflected in medical works like that of Sartorius, who warned people that you could catch the disease through handling the same door handle as a person who had the French pox, or again through sharing clothes, sharing drinking vessels and such like. Um, and we also see it in the municipal records held in the Stadtarchiv or the city archive in Nuremberg, where the doctor's reports from the late 17th century still exist. Um, and in 1684, a doctor reported to the city council that uh, one soldier in the city ought to be given treatment for the disease because his case of the disease had arisen not from any kind of immorality or any kind of lifestyle factors, but because he had spent 24 hours in what's described as a bad environment. So an environment that was probably very hot or very damp and cold, I would imagine. Um, and this disturbed his humoral balance and caused a, a case of the disease to simply kind of spontaneously generate within him. Um, and similarly, or well, quite similarly, in 1686, uh, another doctor, uh, indeed actually in this case it was a doctor and a surgeon, both reported to the council that aid should be given to a woman who had contracted her case of the disease uh, from infected clothing and from sleeping in an infected bed as well. And in both of these cases and in a couple of other cases as well where the doctor's reports exist um, and where they cite non-venereal forms of contagion, the city went forward and gave charitable support without any, um, without any argument. They were very happy to provide help for these people. That said, however, uh, this desire to distinguish between the deserving and the undeserving poor certainly does persist in the 17th century. And I would argue it does start to become a little bit more intense, especially in the late 17th century. Um, because it's in the late 17th century that the council issues its first orders against native victims of the disease. It's about, in, it's in 1650 that they say, we will no longer support anyone who has contracted the disease through unzucht. Uh, and unzucht is a term that you can translate as immorality quite broadly, or you can take it to mean sexually immorality, as they would define it as well. Um, and the city does seem, to, um, it does seem to wish to narrow the base of people that it's allowing into treatment at this time. But nonetheless, uh, the aid does continue, um, and there is at least in the for the years 60, for the 1680s, for 1681 to 1689, the council funded at least 50, uh, 50 cases for treatment in this period. 
So I'm going to, well, my first part of my conclusion is rather a question, and that is, is the French pox syphilis? Now, I'm not asking this as, um, as a scientist would ask this question, perhaps, although um, a recent a study by Gall et al., I think they're based at the University of Zurich, has suggested that the bacterium did undergo some kind of change during uh, the early modern period. But I'll leave that question uh, to the scientists and those who handle it best. But conceptually, is the French pox syphilis? Well, I hope I've given you some uh, insight into the concepts um, that underpinned this disease during uh, the period 1495 to 1700. Um, and there's so much more we could talk about in terms of um, more nuanced medical understandings, other socio-cultural influences. But I hope that I've shown that um, this really, during the, during the early modern period, the concepts, um, the basis of knowledge, uh, the cultural beliefs at the time, they really give rise to an understanding of a disease that is very different to how we look at syphilis today. But I'll leave you each to draw your own conclusions on that. But thinking then, the other part of what I wanted to talk about, of course, was how do people respond uh, to, how, how did the civic governments respond to the French pox in particular? Um, and I would argue, and my thesis argues, that the primary driver between a lot, behind a lot of this response is contagion. How do they think the disease is spreading? Um, and what does this mean for, for them and for the public sphere in terms of containment um, and how can they best protect, protect the population? And that links very closely with practicality. How do you safely protect your healthy population? Um, and also what are the, kind of the most economically viable options for you to do that as well? And finally, of course, there's also the factor of morality, which is very... Um, you've seen it has two sides, I think, in this, um, in this discussion, because morality not, only, uh, morality not only underpinned how, um, how the disease could be stigmatised and how those with the disease could be stigmatised, how they could be cast out, but it also played an essential role in how they could be included and how the council could indeed justify treating those with the disease and in particular how it could justify treating those with the disease that it really could legally abdicate responsibility for. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk backslash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.